Hi everyone, this is Lori Carnivore Cheer is my channel and I would like to thank you for stopping by and watching today. If you've been here before, welcome back. And I'd like to issue a special thanks to all my new subscribers. I appreciate every single one of you. Thank you so much for joining my subscriber family. And for everyone else uh, for whom this is my uh, your first visit to my channel, I hope you'll enjoy what you're hearing and feel free to watch my other videos. And um, once again, welcome. Today, I'm going to talk about a topic that ties together the whole area of healthy eating with the wider world, with what that means to making a better world for us, for healing humanity. And that phrase comes from a documentary that Carrie Mann of Homestead Howe is making with a very dedicated team. And he's working very hard. He's traveling all over the place, interviewing people uh, for the documentary. And I think it's going to be a fantastic project. And um, I am looking forward to watching the documentary when it comes out. But I want to talk about just the idea of how does eating a proper human diet involve um, just healing the world in general. And I'm going to start out with a story that is quite sad. But this video is going to end on a note of hope. So please stay with me. So here we go. On February 14th, 2024, Kansas City, Missouri was in a festive mood. They had welcomed their Super Bowl champion, Kansas City Chiefs home, and had given them a wonderful parade. Just as the parade was wrapping up, a shooter fired into the crowd, killing a young mother of two and injuring more than 20 other people, including several children. Everyone was just shocked and horrified. The people in the crowd, the families of those who were injured and killed, the players, the coaches, everyone. Um, it was incredibly sad. And especially for me, because I used to live in Kansas City, and it is truly a wonderful city. And I'm so sorry that violence was visited upon Kansas City. So that sadness stayed with me for several days. But it was interesting that not two days later, um, Harry of Homestead Health did a walk and talk video in which he talked about normalizing sickness and how tragic that was, how much we kind of just have given up on the idea that anyone can be well and get well and that sickness is just sort of part of our lives now. And he asked the question, can humanity be healed? And I thought back on the Kansas City tragedy and, oh, brother, um, it can be healed, and I think it's got to be healed. And not two days after that, um, Harry uh, posted another video, this time with Adam Lacey, one of the people who was working on the documentary. Uh, they had traveled to Tennessee to interview Dr. Ken Berry, and they were talking with great excitement about that interview, which sounds like it was a really wonderful interview. And they talked about, you know, the, the blessings and the power of a proper human diet. And once again, that question came up, can humanity be healed? And so I thought, I, I have to really explore this um, because it's a very compelling question. And it has to do with my own personal journey of healing from a very destructive carb and sugar-based diet to a healthy diet that is centered on meat. So I was thinking about that whole idea of healing. And I thought back on, you know, just the idea of how do we get to this place? When I thought about the Kansas City tragedy at Super Bowl victory parade, I was thinking, here we go again another mass shooting. We have had so many of these in the United States that over the last you know, couple of decades, where children have been murdered, where innocent bystanders have been murdered, and just horrible carnage. And it's like, what is wrong? Why, why all this violence? Why, why are all these people killing so many people? And so it, it just 
made me think about the way that the world is seeing life in general. It's not a very pretty picture when you think about, you know, the increasing incidents of violence like this, because we know that there have been many, many, many more mass shootings um, recently than, let's say, you know, 50 or more years ago. And I think that, I don't know whether that's because of that or, you know, whether this started before that, but there's starting to be a general sad, cynical look at life. And I'm old enough to remember um, seeing this creep into our psyche for quite some time now. Um, we've been looking at life more and more cynically uh, with a more and more jaded view of things. And if you look at uh, political discourse and other types of just commentary in general, whether it's the editorial page of the newspaper or social media or whatever, you know, it's, it's just people had given up on a world of good um, and that, that we're sort of stuck with all of this evil in our world. And I thought back years and years ago, and I'm going way, way back, because we we started to view people differently in, in several types of media. Um, I remember, for example, um, the television that I grew up with as a small child. You know, there were a lot of um, 30 minute dramas, of good guys and bad guys, and typically the good guys won. They were challenged, but they, they won. And over the years, I noticed that, you know, getting more into the 70s and, and the 80s, that that kind of good guy paradigm was um, being tossed aside. You know, a lot of uh, the newer writers coming up in the industry were thinking, you know, that's, that's boring, that's unrealistic. You know, it's, it's, it's just not edgy enough. They wanted edgier drama. In which you know that show people's flaws and and you know people being mean and and things like that you know the way that uh, human nature is sort of to speak and I remember being very disturbed by that because I had been exposed to enough reality of cruelty abuse you know I have seen quite a lot of it since I was a child and. So I did not like this trend. I wanted to believe that somehow we could keep evolving and, and keep reaching for the light and reaching for good, but that just was not happening. And now it's gotten to the point where I think there's a lot of just, you know, hopelessness about the human condition. You know, you hear things like, well, all politicians are, are corrupt, you know, um, no matter what you do, it's not going to help. Um, you know, even when you talk about healthy eating, it's like, well, you know, the carnivore diet is going to stop the shootings. You know, well, of course it is. No one would, would be foolish enough to believe that. But anytime someone talks about, you know, trying to look towards the light, it's it's more and more difficult now. So, um, you know, we, we, we tend to think that, you know, it's all bad and we've just got to somehow go with the flow. You know, people say, <clears throat> there's nothing you can do about factory farming. Big Ag is here to stay. Um, you know, when you're older, you get sicker. You know, there's nothing you can do. And one person who um, was reacting to somebody that wanted to talk about like regenerative farming, things like that, he goes, that's just not going to happen. You know, big corporate farming is here to stay. Adapt or die. Oh, my word. Who wants to live in a world like that? So all of this stuff, you know, is, is very hard to deal with sometimes. And it makes it harder to believe that things that you do to improve your life will make any difference either to you or to anybody else, or it won't touch the world in any way. And that is very sad because it spills into how we define life and how we phrase our definitions of life. Now, everyone has heard phrases like this. That's life. 
or life is what happens to you when you're making other plans or well you set a goal or you try to make plans or do something and then life comes along and grabs you and knocks you down and you know that's that's so fascinating because all of these descriptions view life as some external entity that's lurking in the bushes that's going to come out and grab you and screw you up. You know, it's like life is a lot. And that is very sad because life is not an external entity. It is us. It is me. It is you. We are life. And so when people say stuff like life happens, even if they don't mean it viciously or negatively, it's just still putting life out there as something that's going to get. And we are life. And what makes that life alive, truly alive, is health. So I believe that health is life. Without health, there is really no quality of life. So that is where I think the link between healing the world or healing humanity and eating in a healthy way that builds us, that nourishes us, that sustains us, rather than kills us and poisons us. That that really is truly matters. So that's where I see the connection. And what I think is, is very sad is that um, you know, we look at sickness, and this is something else that Carrie mentioned in this walk and talk video. We normalize it. And he was very distressed in his video with good reason because we just assume that yep, sickness happens, you know, especially, and that's an especially bad hit on the idea of getting older. Now, we've all heard phrases like this. Well, once you hit 60, you know, you're going to fall apart. Or sickness is just part of getting older. Or, well, you know, older people always have a lot of medical issues. And, you know, just on and on, you know. Um, and we hear it, you know, from people who are taking prescription medicine, you know. Uh, well, I, I was given this prescription that I got to take for this or that condition. Oh, well, how long do you have to take it? For the rest of my life. And it's like that, you know, that just seems the normal state of affairs. And finally, we are starting to hear some pushback about that. And I am very, very glad to hear that. Because is it really inevitable that we're just going to get sick if we get older? Um, now, I am over 70 years old, and I feel that I'm in better health now than I was in my 30s. So I hope that I'm a little bit of a um, a kickback to some of this stuff because, you know, it's it just hasn't happened that way with me, and I feel very blessed for that. But, you know, it's, it's still an uphill battle because that type of idea that, you know, life just throws stuff at you when you get older, it's it's all downhill from here. That's been pretty hardwired into our culture. And it's a huge challenge to um, to try to dispel that. And that's why this question that uh, Carrie and Adam have raised, you know, um, this humanity is doing, why that is an absolutely critical question. Now, sadly, you know, a lot of the um, physical problems that we have seen, um, you know, the, the chronic illness, now chronic illness accounts for more than 70% of the United States healthcare dollars. You know, chronic illness is the biggest health problem we have. And unfortunately, there is a parallel between that um, chronic illness and its stronger presence in our lives and some real problems with a decline in our mental health over several generations. 
And Dr. Georgia Eve, who is a psychiatrist who is specializing now in nutrition science, has done some very interesting research about this. And it's very distressing because she has um, talked to, done a lot of research in which she has found that um, among first year students at colleges and universities, they come to campus in their freshman year already medicated for depression and anxiety. And a lot of times, one of the first things they do when they hit campus is to go to the um, student health center and ask for counseling. And that is a trend that is very disturbing. Um, when I went to college a few million years ago, <clears throat> you know, there were a few instances of that, but it wasn't a normal occurrence. Um, some 700,000 people commit suicide every year. The depression and anxiety alone cost the global economy some $3 billion a year. And you heard that right, not million, billion. And Dr. Ede really is convinced that we are in a global mental health crisis. So here we have increasing issues with our mental health and a lot of issues with our physical health. And those two together are a potent danger for all of us in the world. So we have to, I think one thing that we have to do is really find out more about what it means to be uh, chronically ill. And is it inevitable that we are going to be chronically ill? Um, you know, we keep hearing that chronic, so many chronic illnesses are irreversible. And for the first time, um, and I'm very encouraged to hear this, there is starting to be some pushback, um, not only Dr. Eve, but <clears throat> some other um, doctors and psychiatrists are taking a second look at this. Uh, Dr. Chris Palmer is the author of a book called Brain Energy, in which he is seeing a metabolic link between um, some very serious psychiatric disorders and what people eat, what, how healthy they're eating. And of course, some of these disorders you know, are so serious that they can't be eliminated altogether. But he is starting to notice um, a trend toward um, real improvement in some of the symptoms for some people who just could barely function, um, have at least part of their life back. And that is very encouraging. And Dr. Ede has found this in her research as well, that there seems to be, and there is mounting evidence of, a metabolic role in both the attainment of physical health and mental health. And when you look at the whole link between metabolic health and chronic illness, both physical and mental, um, you know, there is something else to, to consider here because over the last maybe 50 years or so, despite everything that seems to have been done, every intervention, every type of medicine, every treatment, the most serious chronic illnesses, the incidence of diagnosis of those illnesses continue to rise, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, those are three big ones. Uh, first take diabetes. Now we have tons more medications for diabetes than we did let's say 50 years ago. When my father was diagnosed with diabetes, um, there were only one or two oral medications available back then. Now there are countless numbers of them. Um, so people will often say, well, yeah, there's all these new medications that people can live with a perfectly normal life with type 2 diabetes. But this is not about um, the treatments and medicines available. It is why are more people than ever being diagnosed 
with type 2 diabetes and at younger ages. Dr. Robert Lustig found that in his practice with, with teenagers and you know young children, that he's got kids, or he had kids coming into his office as young as 10 with fatty liver, pre-diabetes, or full-blown type 2 diabetes. Now, years ago, you never heard of kids having diabetes, and now it's happening with increasing regularity. So more people are being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. The numbers keep going up. Why? Same thing with cancer. More people are getting cancer now, despite all of the interventions we hear about, all the new treatments, all the new drugs. And people could argue, yeah, but the cancer deaths are down. Once again, this is not about cancer deaths. The question is, why are more people, an increasing number of people, getting diagnosed with cancer, whether they live and we hope they will live, or whether they don't live? So the big question here is, why is this happening? Why are these diagnoses occurring? Heart disease, same thing. All the new medicine, all the interventions, heart disease continues to go up. And people might say, yeah, but that's because people eat too much saturated fat and their arteries are all closed up. Well, a couple of problems with that argument. Number one, our dietary guidelines over the last 50 years or so have argued strongly against saturated fat, don't eat saturated fat, bad for you, eat margarine instead of butter, use vegetable oil instead of butter, um, don't eat fried foods, you know, avoid red meat, you know, all of these things. We've been advised for that, those things for years. And people did cut back on red meat consumption. Is heart disease going down? No. The incidence of heart disease is going up. Why? What's going on here? So fortunately, a lot of um, doctors are starting to challenge some of the um, existing ideas about the role of cholesterol in heart health overall. Um, you know, just the, the role of saturated fat, which has been demonized over the last 50 years. And both fat and cholesterol are actually essential to the human body because the brain is largely fat and it needs fat. Um, and so it's, you know, we're, we're still kind of hardwired into all of this idea about fat is bad, you know, um, red meat is bad, and it's going to take a while, you know. And, you know, diet is not a simple thing. There are some people who maybe do have some issues eating red meat that maybe their, their digestive system just are not compatible with that. So I'm not recommending things that people can't do, but the overall um, issue here, I think, with eating is not that we're eating too much red meat. It's not that we're eating too much, such, too much butter. You know, it's that we're eating foods that are not natural. We're eating foods that are so highly processed, have so many chemicals in them. If you eat a box of, and you prepare like, you know, those chicken helpers and other things where you can make casserole, just take something out of the box and stir some chicken in with it, and you don't have a meal in 10 minutes. Those boxed pre prepared foods are just loaded with all kinds of artificial ingredients with names you can't pronounce, um, and sugar, you know, almost if, if you buy any sort of highly processed prepared food, it's going to have sugar. And sugar is addictive. It, you know, it is just, it messes up every part of your, um, your glucose balance, everything else. So we, we have added so many chemicals into the food that we eat. And our vegetables are sprayed with, with all kinds of pesticides that heaven knows what 
how they're harming the body. So I think the idea is um, we need to ask more questions about the food that we eat. Um, we do not need sugar. Sugar is not an essential nutrient. It is just a highly addictive substance. And we should keep it away from children, keep it away from everybody, actually. But the whole idea is that maybe there is a way that food can help us heal both ourselves individually and in turn, every time one of us heals ourselves, we contribute a little bit to healing humanity. Um, I like to think of this wonderful term from Hebrew, um, tikkun olam, let us repair the world. And that sounds very grandiose because, well, I don't want to repair the world. I just want to get healthy. Well, that's, that's wonderful. But when you heal yourself, whatever good you do to yourself, that is a tiny spark of healing the world. So I think the term healing humanity is a wonderful uh, parallel to the idea of just healing the world, repairing the world. So I would urge everyone, you know, now if um, you are taking any medications, of course, you want to make sure you just don't drop those medications without speaking um, to your health practitioner, your doctor, or your nurse practitioner, whoever prescribes medications for you. Um, because, for example, if you do have type 2 diabetes and you make a, 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 a significant change and, and drastically lower carbohydrates, that could have an impact on how your medication um, affects your blood glucose level. So you have to, you know, you have to proceed very carefully. But I am convinced now that we can really heal a lot of chronic illness. We can either put it into remission or sometimes reverse it. Um, you know, I think people are a little bit afraid to use the word cure. And maybe that is a little bit premature, but the testimonials that I have heard over and over and over again about how people have been able to get off depression and anxiety medication, how they feel better physically and mentally, they're, they have more mental clarity, they're happier. You know, when they, they adopted a proper human diet made of, of wholesome, unprocessed foods that are as natural as possible. And yes, you can, you can find unprocessed wholesome food if it goes through the door. Um, because not all of us can, um, you know, buy, there's, there may not be a local rancher around where you can buy, you know, um, buy beef or whatever. So, um, you know, there are, there are options with the grocery store. You just have to go, go past the middle aisles and go right to the back where the meat and the eggs are. And you should be able to, to find a lot of really good food there. And, you know, it doesn't all have to be red meat. I mean, chicken, salmon, you know, other types of fish, you know, it, it's all good. So um, I think in general, in looking back on the um, question of can we heal humanity? Um, does humanity need to be healed? Indeed it does. And can we heal humanity? I believe we can, and I believe we must. Um, back in 1962, President Kennedy was talking with great excitement about sending someone to the moon uh, before the 1960s were, were finished. Sending someone to the moon and bringing him safely back to Earth. And he said, we, <clears throat> We plan to go to the moon and do other things like this, not because they're easy, but because they are hard. And if we want to do them first, and we want to do them right, we must be bold. So yes, we, I believe that we can heal humanity, we must heal humanity, and we must be bold. 
So thank you very much for watching today. Um, and always remember, as our friend Bill Knott says, be kind to one another. Listen up, lift up, and cheer up. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.